be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest like sailors in a tempest together and it could be just you and me we'll be family just wait and see Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's Lung Cancer Living Room, coming to you live from uh, D.C. We're so happy to have all of you here tonight. I talked to um, a couple of people as they were coming in and found out that some of you um, watch this living room regularly um, from California, so we're really excited to be out on the East, East Coast today. We're so excited tonight to have this wonderful crew here um, from Johns Hopkins. So with that... I'm going to turn it over to introductions before we get into the meat of our program. So I don't know who wants to start. Rashida, do you want to start? Since you're right sure. next to no me. Problem. Oh, you're right. oh, I'm Mike. That's right. Hello, everyone. Thank you all. This is a great opportunity. I think this is so necessary for patients, caregivers, family members, and just the lay person. My name is Rashida Persinger Adams. I'm an oncology nurse practitioner, and I have the pleasure of working with Dr. Levy as well as Candace. Um, and yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm Ben Levy. I'm an associate professor at Johns Hopkins. I'm the clinical director for the Hopkins program, uh, cancer program here in D.C. Um, you know, I guess you wanted me to answer why I went into lung cancer. I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret. Um, I went into lung cancer Primarily at the beginning because everyone knows I'm a fairly, I'm a straight shooter. It was easy. It was really easy. I mean, there weren't that, there wasn't a lot going on and there was, you know, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do uh, when I first started. And this was 11 years ago. And I say that because there were really just three drugs in 2008. I mean, there was Alimta, there was Avastin, and there was Tarceva. And... I say that because there has just been a groundswell of science and drugs, and it has been an extraordinary journey to see all of this unfold. And, you know, we, we can talk about this when we talk about the, the treatment paradigm, but, I mean, every month is different. If we have this meeting next month, the discussion will probably be a little bit different based on new approvals or new drugs. So the science is fascinating. It's kept me in this. Um, I do more targeted therapy than immunotherapy, but I do both, and we'll talk about those differences. But it really, I'm, you know, the reason I went into this and the common denominator is you. Um, I, I, I really love taking care of patients. I like being the person involved when when things get critical and there are challenging situations, there's a lot that, that is gratifying and, and connecting with patients is really my passion and many of you in the room hopefully know that. <laughs> um, uh, but but, I, but I'm, I'm very excited to be here and you know, it's good to be on a college campus and for old time's sake when I got on I called my dad and asked him for some money. So, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Candace Graham. I'm a thoracic nurse navigator. I got into um, oncology and actually the world of navigating by accident. I came to D.C. as a travel nurse um, 
in a navigation role, which is like really unheard of to be a traveling navigator with no experience, no background. And I fell in love with the job. I have a MPH, which is a master's degree in public health. So I found that navigating allowed me to incorporate public health since I'm dealing with chronic disease and cancer and also nursing where I am educating. I, I'm still having patient contact and I'm not by at the bedside, but I still get to connect with my patients on a one-on-one -on -one level. So I fell in love with this perfect blend of, you know, nursing and public health and became a nurse navigator. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks. So now we're going to jump into uh, the conversation and tonight's topic, as you um, all may know, is navigating lung cancer from diagnosis through treatment and beyond. So um, we want, I want to start a little bit um, at the diagnosis um, process and what, what, what that looks like, um, if you want to get a little bit there. Yeah, I think most of uh, my patients, we walk through this. Um, the, the, the di what I call the diagnostic algorithm for lung cancer has completely altered in the past even 24 months. And when I first started, you know, non-small cell lung cancer was one disease. It was essentially a, a histological diagnosis, meaning you did the biopsy, you took the slide, you looked at it under the microscope, and that was it. And they called it non-small cell lung cancer, and you either had two types. You had adenocarcinoma or squamous cell. And really, over the past 10 years, what we've learned, and someone said that they lost someone before the, the advent of molecular testing, and I think that's relevant. I think what we've learned about lung cancer is that it's not just one disease, and that's evidenced by people saying they have a BRAF mutation or an ALK mutation or an EGFR mutation. The treatment roads based on those mutations are very different. So when a patient walks through the door, and many of you patients know this, we, we want to make, A, a diagnosis of lung cancer uh, and make sure we have that diagnosis right, but then we want to subtype it histologically. So the first step is... Is it an adenocarcinoma or squamous cell? Those are funky names. That's just the names of how it looks like under the microscope. And then, you know, the real traction and evolution and gains that we've made have been with adenocarcinoma, which the majority of you in this room have. Uh, it essentially is more common in never smokers or former smokers, and we don't know why it happens in never smokers. And we want to do something called genomic profiling. And that can be done... Uh, by the biopsy. So we essentially take that biopsy and we send it off for genetic testing. And I tell my patients this, these are not genes you're born with. Even though there was a patient back there who said that they have family members and there are certainly inheritable causes of lung cancer that we have not yet identified, these genes are only in your cancer. They are not in your normal cells, your skin cells, your lung cells that are not, uh, that don't have cancer. So we do genetic testing. Um, that really what we call, it's, you know, in the business, next generation sequencing. So we do a comprehensive genomic profiling. And the reason we do that is that we now know that patients that have certain genes, and many of you are a testament to this, can be wedded to targeted therapies, pills that go after the particular gene that we identify. And so every patient, I think it's, the word is still not out there. And, and online, this is so important that when you're at your doctor's office, the diagnosis of just lung cancer or even adenocarcinoma is not enough. You need the genetic underpinnings, the DNA that governs your cancer to grow, to understand that, to interrogate it, and to identify the relevant mutations that if identified, we can wed to targeted therapy. And so many of the room have, you know, the list of genes that we now look for is growing. And I, again, if we would have done this talk uh, six months ago, I couldn't tell you about intract fusions, which are yet another rare gene that we see in lung cancer that if we identify, we can give a targeted therapy to. The last thing I'll say, two more comments because I have a tendency to run on. Um, two more comments I want to make about next generation sequencing and uh, the two fabulous women that are to my side know this very well in my passion. And that is, is that we do a tissue biopsy, but every patient that walks through the door also gets a liquid biopsy. And I think it is critical um, that every patient has a liquid biopsy as well because tissue misses some of the genes and the liquid can identify the ones that sometimes tissue misses. A liquid biopsy concept, people think that's crazy. How does that happen? Well, 
DNA from your cancer or pa patient's cancer is being shed into the bloodstream. And we now have the technology to detect that DNA and sequence it the same way we sequence a tissue test. And so it's the same technology. It's essentially looking at the cancer from the biopsy, you can do the same thing. Look at the cancer from the level of the DNA in the blood, take it, sequence it, and I understand what the genomic underpinnings. That's the first point I want to make. The last point, the second point, and last point I want to make about the diagnostic algorithm is that every patient also needs a PDL1 test. PDL1 is a protein test, not a gene test. It's different. It can only be done on the tissue. And if you have a level of protein that's high, patients can be candidates for what we call immunotherapy. People get confused. What's immunotherapy? What's targeted therapy? We can certainly talk about that. Targeted therapy generally are pills used to treat patients who have a genomic or gene that we can identify. Immunotherapy is another class that's different. It's usually an infusion that we use to treat patients that either have a high PDL1 or protein score, or we use it in combination with chemotherapy for patients who don't have genes. Yeah, so I think it's interesting, and um, um, a lot of you in the room, and some of you watching maybe even, are fortunate enough to be seen by these folks here, right? We do a lot of work in the community, where sometimes, especially in more rural areas, patients aren't even being tested for EGFR yeah. alkin ross one let alone a comprehensive yeah. um, genomic profile. So I think it's really important, um, and just points back to one of the reasons that we do this, is to really further explain and flesh out for you what this means and how important it is, which is why what we're talking about today yeah. um, is so meaningful. And uh, um, Candace and, and, and Rashida know this well, you know, tissue is, uh, tissue is not perfect. We try so hard to get enough tissue to do this testing, but oftentimes we don't get enough and you either have to go back and biopsy or again, my passion has been looking at the liquid as well so that we're able to capture many of these mutations that may be missed in tissue. And if you look at the rates of testing across the community hospitals, it's not great. And you know, the word still needs to get out there that, and it has to come you know, unfortunately or fortunately from patients. Patients have to be their own advocate to say, what did you do with my tissue? Did you do just an EGFR? Did you do comprehensive genomic profile? Because it's critical that, that it's not just EGFR or ALK that's being done. I mean, I think that's, you know, so 2002. And then, so 2005. Could I just interject to something else? I think, because um, a lot of patients like, well, they got tissue, and isn't that the gold standard? But as Dr. Levy is saying, you got to think about they're going in to get tissue. You know, lung is a very heterogeneous type of cancer, and so depending on which area they pull from and they send off to pathology, may or may not capture that mutation. And I think that's why even more so Dr. Levy, as well as the literature, has been presented in regards to just don't take tissue as a negative. Give the patient a benefit of the doubt to at least, at least still do liquid plasma testing, next generation sequencing, whatever you want to call it, to ensure that patients do not harbor a mutation. And I just want to explain the, the heterogeneity of it a little more. That's a big word. And, and a lot of times pa people don't, patients don't understand what that means or why it might be here and not over here. Can, I don't know who wants to take it, but if you want to take so it, Rashida. I, I think of it like this when patients ask me in lamest terms, right? Say you have a pizza and you have half pepperoni, half vegetable, and maybe, maybe half pepperoni, fourth of it vegetable, and a fourth of it chicken, right? And you're trying to get that chicken piece, right? And depending on where they're going in to get that piece of pizza to pull out, you may pull out a pepperoni and not the chicken that has the mutation. So it's just to say that the lung, mass, nodule, whatever we're targeting is different. It has different components and depending on where we pull from, it de depends on what will or determines what we'll get in pathology. I'm 100% using that. <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm using I it now. It. I'm using yeah. it now. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. Did you have a question? Kim, there, oh, do you have another one? Go ahead. Forward, and then we'll pass it back. So just following up on that, is there any chance that the, any portion of the pizza is lost when you do the liquid diagnosis? So mm -hmm. can I? Yeah. Can you so ahead. basically the idea is liquid is able to assess what we call temporal spatial heterogeneity, mm -hmm. which is essentially can assess mutations that have developed over time because it, sh it should address that. It should address, because everything that most of the time 
the, all slices of the pizza are shedding DNA into the blood. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a needle, like Rashida said, you're just <clears> in one spot. And that's classic for lung cancer. It's so heterogeneous. It is, some of it is clonal, meaning it all has the same DNA, but then it's got cousins and half-sisters and what? some distant relatives that have all developed over time that make up that conglomerate mass that may not harbor the exact same gene that was in the founder cell. Um, how often should, or is it just once, do these, if you've had a, a biopsy of a tumor in the lung and they run this genetic profile, do they continue to update it or is it just what it is? So, so you, do you, do, if, you know, four years later, started, do you need to yeah. have that panel redone? We're going to tag team this one. We're so, going to start. <laughs> so let me just say for EGFR mutations, right? So there are, <laughs> in EGFR mutation prior to April of last year, um, there were first and second line generations based off of the EGFR mutation. But what we do, did find out in EGFR is that there's some, some patients develop a resistant strain, right? I won't give all into the details or whatever, but it's a resistant strain. So therefore, <laughs> it does warrant us to go back in to see if you develop this resistant strain, resistant strain that makes you eligible for a third generation um, TKI or EGFR mutation drug, right? Such as osimertinib or Tegriso is probably what you all are familiar with. So in some cases, and I'll let Dr. Levy kind of tag team and give you a little bit more, yes, it is warranted to go back in to see if there's a resistant strain that could change treatment options. So when you say go back in, Blood or, Blood tissue. or tissue. Yep. So a second biopsy. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's where the field's moving. I think now that Tegriso's moved up front, front line, yeah. and Electinib has moved front line for ALK, and we have two drugs for BRAF uh, that are front line now. You know, the idea is, is that at some point, these cancers out... So yes, you want one at the beginning to identify the mutation. The question is, when should you do the next one? And there's been a lot of debate about this internally. There's been a lot of debate at committee levels, at national levels. There's been a lot of debate uh, about this uh, at the level of insurance companies. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, many people have, we have advocated that we should be doing another biopsy at the time of resistance. Meaning once you see that cancer start to grow, as Rashida mentioned, there may be something at play, a resistant mutation or mechanisms of resistance that you can identify that may inform on subsequent treatment decisions. So I don't want to get too in the weeds because this could go on for a long time um, about the new mutations that are post Tegriso or the new, new, new mutations that we're identifying post Electinib. Um, we're, we're just learning what these are and how we can act on them. But I am trying to do we had a, a conference call, a group of physicians around the country with a, 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 a um, insurance company, a big insurance company today, advocating for blood at, at the time of resistance because blood can pick up on this. It's, an, it's a cool story. A patient walks in and they have cancer that's growing on their current targeted therapy, do a liquid, see if there's a mutation that you can then act on with another drug. So we're not there yet, but we're, we're just learning how to do this. I want to talk about the importance of navigation because the role that you and other nurse navigators play in this space is so very important. Can you run us through maybe from a, from a first visit at diagnosis, what, what does your job look like there and how, um, how does it help not only the patient but the entire care team yes. through that entire process? <laughs> So <clears throat> I have the pleasure of sitting in on new patient consults with Dr. Levy, so I'm there from beginning to end to listen to the patient history, to listen to the plan, and basically when Dr. Levy spills it all out and pours out his heart um, with all types of great illustrations and explanations, he leaves the room and it's like, now what happened? <laughs> what did he just say? So it's a true. big role for me is to reiterate education provided by the, the providers. So we review medications, we review um, biomarker testing and really the logistics of getting things done, whatever the plan is. So if the plan is we need scans, we need a PET, we need an MRI, we need liquid biopsy, we need to get your records from this person or that person or you couldn't tell us if you had biomarker testing or NGS testing, let me go find out for you. You know, um, whatever, that, whatever the plan is just to help facilitate and then to discuss the detailed logistics behind it. Yes, we say we want a liquid biopsy. Yes, we say you have to go see this doctor or that doctor and we need this scan or that scan, but Who's going to pay for it? How does it happen? 
Um, who's going to help me do it? So those are the questions that I answer, and that's also a great contribution to the team, I guess, to yes. let them know, like, no guess. Look, it is. <laughs> <laughs> like, you wanted this done, it's going to get done, you know. So that's can I, my role. Can I just, not to, because Rashida and I have been together for three years, but <laughs> not to push Rashida aside. It's okay, but, it's okay. You know, I... So when we were looking for a navigator, I, I, many of you know I was in New York City for 10 years and, and ran the lung cancer program at Sinai. I, I didn't have a navigator there. And when we were talking about navigators, I was like, navigator? Like, what, what does that do? What does that person do? I've already got a nurse practitioner <laughs> who's awesome. We work together. And, you know, I have been so overwhelmed. And I, she knows this because, you know, I call her the awesome navigator. and. Yes. and at her ability, and because this is such a complex diagnosis, and it's so much not just about the science journey or the treatment journey, but the journey spiritually and the journey just navig trying to get through all the scans and what they mean. And like Candace said, like I think I do a good job, but I know I'm become like Charlie Brown, wah wah wah. <laughs> like after like 20 minutes, I'm giving so much data, and I write it down so I can give it to him, but. You know, I have um, been overwhelmed at the role of a navigator and what they can do to get people to our integrative care center, to get people to the scans, making sure they're following up, making sure they're compliant with their drug. Mm -hmm. When we order the Tegriso or the Electinib, making sure that insurance covers it and making sure that they then get the drug and then making sure that they come and visit me one weekend. I have a hard time keeping up with all of this. Um, so I've just, and I'll let Rashida also, because I know Rashida and I always talk about how awesome you are behind your back. Um, I am such a huge advocate of this. Yeah. And not, I mean, I didn't realize the, the importance of this because I thought I did a great job. And I don't. I really don't. I don't have the bandwidth to do it. Yeah. Uh, I thought I was good until I saw how it was actually done. And I'm like, I stink. I don't do this very well at all. I've got my head in the sand with the science and the trials and whatnot, and I sometimes lose sight of the fact that we've got to switch pharmacies. Or, or, you know, we've got to make sure that. I mean, you told me today, Levy, order at Care First, not at not CVS Caremark, not at uh, not at Weinberg Pharmacy in Baltimore. You're at the wrong pharmacy to get the Tegriso, and then getting them into the scans, and then t educating them on the liquid biopsy, and then getting the result back. And I mean, all of these things take such incredible coordination and. I'm, we have the best, I, I am so pleased with the care. I've never seen care like this, and I'm not trying to promote our center because I'm sure all of you are being taken care of, but just having that navigation piece, I'll just give one small personal story that just sort of brings this home. So, and I don't think my dad, even though he did give me money today when I called him <laughs> when I was on campus, would mind saying this. My dad has, you know, he's a physician. He's, he's uh, you know, he thinks of himself as a, fairly sophisticated medical guy. He just retired from being a neonatologist for 20, 30 years. And he was recently diagnosed with two cancers, all thankfully curable, not lung cancer, um, prostate cancer and, and kidney cancer. And he got the, di you know, my family, believe it or not, is from South Georgia. And I grew up from South Georgia, despite how quickly I talk and everyone thinks I'm from New York. My dad was, I was there for 10 years. Um, my dad called me and he said, you know, I, I, I'm going to come up to Sibley in Baltimore to get my opinions. And, you know, he was sitting there, and after all was said and done, he turned to me and goes, I have no idea what's going on. And I said, are you serious? <laughs> and he was like, I don't, I can't process, process this all. I, I am trying so hard to understand, like, the radiation treatments and the Lupron treatments for, pro I can't get through this and they're recommending this scan but I didn't hear why he what he said mm -hmm. and I realized then that you know how complicated this is on the other end and how hard it is to digest everything going through it not just as a one time deal but throughout the care and I also realized how as physicians we fall short sometimes because we can't do it all and Candace really is the glue for that navigation piece. And I just want to say that I've never, I've been overwhelmed at how incredible our practice runs now with just the, not that loose ends is not the right word. So what am I, chopped liver? You are. <laughs> I, here. I told you that you would be chopped liver at some because you know how our, we've already got, know. you know, we, we got, we're good. Um, I don't know, Rashida, before you ask anything, if you want to say anything, because we've talked about this yeah. offline, just like, thank God. I think, you know, initially when we brought the idea of a nurse navigator, Dr. Levy was like, well, but you do that. So, but I don't understand. Why can't you? I'm like, 
Dr. Levy, you understand that if I am able to, you know, pass some of the things that I was doing, it allows me to act more efficiently as a role in the nurse practitioner, which helps him as well, because as he says, he has a lot of clinical trials. He's always looking for what's the next treatment, what's the next next option, how can we enroll patients in this and that. And so for a nurse practitioner, it allows me to still be entwined with patients because I love patients, it's my passion, I love what I do, um, but also the navigation piece that Candace does, I don't have to question if it's done. She's always constantly like, what do you need me to do for you all? You know, and how can I get this done? And it's never a question of why or no. She is very diligent in her work. And I say that because in lung cancer, in any type of cancer, and Dr. Levy just said it as well, it takes a village to get patients through this journey. And patients need to know their resources and who is available to help them get get through this journey that no one asks for. It's not on anyone's bucket list. I don't think so. Um, so I am very appreciative to Candace, and I think mm -hmm. I've said it to her numerous times that what would we do without you? Because mm -hmm. she is really beneficial to the team, along with other people, social worker, you know, paint, um, palliative team. You know, it takes a village to make sure that patients are taken care mm -hmm. of well during this journey. Oh, I'd be brave if you're brave I'd be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest Together and it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see